Hello and welcome to my second guide on the DAISY standalone. My name is Marino from the Trusted Medics of the Wasteland and this time I'm going to focus on the things that I said I wouldn't be able to include in my first guide. Today I'm going to start talking about the health and medical system, covering the most important facts that I consider to be relevant for everyone. I think there are going to be two more videos on the medical system, one about the various sicknesses, diseases and infections, and another on medical appliances and the diagnosis and treatment of conditions. No promises yet though, just what's in the back of my head. For now, let's take a look at the contents of this video. The main topic is the question, what is keeping me alive in the DAISY standalone? And inversely, of course, what is killing me in the DAISY standalone? To tackle those questions, I'm going to talk about the properties and effects of your blood level, and of course what the effects of the mysterious new health value are and how it works. I will then focus on the ominous health and healing statuses that you can get in your inventory screen, and why they aren't just decoration. I'm then going to give a short summary to make sure we're all on the same page, and then it's going to be story time. I'm going to tell you the tale of Hank and Bill. This video wasn't originally planned, but due to popular demand I decided to go ahead and gather all the information I already had on the medical topics to see what's still missing and what I'm unsure about. My knowledge stems again mostly from my own observations and curious mind that just can't stop thinking about how things work, even if I wanted to. I conducted a number of experiments, trying to isolate what I'm trying to observe as much as possible and using the reliable numbers that are available in the interwebs as orientation. The numbers and some general ideas come from sites such as the DayZ forums, the great medical guide that was posted there recently, and various informational pages. It's those numbers that make observations and conclusions possible. They are the blind man's cane without which we would be lost in the darkness when it comes to trying to figure out stuff. And again a short disclaimer, this video is based on the DayZ standalone version 0.30.113925. Since the DayZ standalone is currently in pre-alpha, a lot of changes are bound to happen down the road, so everything I'm going to tell you about is subject to change. Also, the feedback we get in the game is very limited and makes precise measuring of the conditions for effects to appear extremely difficult, but I tried my best at doing so. Of course, everything I say is to the best of my knowledge. If I'm still unsure about something, I'll highlight it in blue and mention explicitly that this is an educated guess. And a quick shout out to the guys and gals over at TMW and friends who assisted me in my experiments by shooting, beating, punching and poisoning me, knocking me out and reanimating me, filling and emptying countless blood and saline bags, and of course discussing and contributing to the observations. No assistants were harmed in the making of this video. Only me. A lot. Also a thanks to you folks over on YouTube and the DayZ forums for bringing up questions about game mechanics and doubting what I'm telling you. And I don't mean that in a herpeter kind of way. It's my goal to get you to understand and to think, not just to swallow what you're being told. If you critically evaluate what you see, that tells me that I'm achieving this goal, and it only allows us to further confirm correct observations, or refute wrong or only partially correct ones, to improve the knowledge base for everyone, and for science. But enough with the forward, let's get to business. In my last video about the nutrition and regeneration system, I introduced the five what are called bodily storages. In the previous video, we were primarily concerned with the stomach, water and energy, and the effects those three have on the remaining two, blood and health. This time we're going to flip the focus around and talk primarily about blood and health. Let's first take a look at blood. As you may remember, your maximum blood capacity is 5000. Now this is different from the 12000 in the mod, and also the role of blood has shifted quite substantially from its previous one as an all-round health indicator. So don't be surprised about the difference in numbers. Now you probably don't care too much about your blood level before it starts to drop. So let's take a few hits and talk about the effects of your blood level dropping. One of the most common causes of blood loss is being shot for no reason at all. You were just leisurely strolling across, well, the airfield, when a big scary dude with a gas mask and an assault rifle shoots you, even though you yelled friendly. But still he rudely interrupted your search for a gas mask and an assault rifle, I suppose. So yeah, that happens. On the other hand, sometimes you also get shot for a very good reason, and shame on you for that. And as if being shot at wasn't enough already, you also get punched in the face, clubbered with a baseball bat, chopped with a hatchet, or bitten and scratched by a zombie, and sometimes rabbit new spawns. At some point, you may also get sick in one way or the other, which can have a dangerous creeping impact on your blood level if left untreated. This may be the subject of a future video. Another cause for blood loss are dehydration and starvation, which should be avoided at all costs. 
If they do set in, you lose blood at a staggering rate and may easily die without external health. I did. Twice. And finally, of course, there's bleeding in various degrees, from a superficial cut in your pinky to a gushing wound in the abdomen and appropriate rates of blood loss. Yum. Now you may have noticed the ever so subtle effect the decreasing blood level has on your screen. Its colors fade. They desaturate. This is a fairly uncommon effect, but it's really just the equivalent of what you may know from other games. There you may have a number, a bar, symbols of some sort, and in recent years, especially in first-person shooters, blood spatters on your eyes. Right. Anyway, the way DayZ shows the relation between your maximum and your current amount of blood is through desaturation. The more faded the colors are, the lower your blood level is. Simple as that. However, this can be tricky to gauge at first, especially noticing the often smooth transition can make this difficult and potentially dangerous. But you will get a feel for it over time and understand which levels of desaturation are still acceptable and when you should really not get hit anymore, except by the needle of an IV. Also, note that nothing else affects your saturation and blood loss affects no other visual effects. So, now that we've clarified that, let's take a look back at our blood bar and see how... Ah, oh, damn it. We were still bleeding. Did we forget to bandage up? <clears throat> our blood level has reached zero by now. If we had only been here a few seconds earlier, we would have seen the last few specks of color disappear from our vision, covering the world in a creepy, bright, whitish veil. So that's it. Blood out. All blood lost. Get ready to respawn at the coast without our bravely earned gas mask and assault rifle. We're dead. Or are we? Here's the kicker. Even losing all your blood does not kill you. What you talking about, Marino? It's not the loss of blood that kills you. At least not directly. You can, in fact, drop to absolute zero blood. Your body is completely devoid of any red and white blood cells, and you're still alive. Well, technically, you're definitely unconscious. But you won't die from it without further influences. However, you also won't recover from it without external influences. Of course, currently you effectively die if you lock out while being unconscious, so it's tempting to treat every black screen with the white words of doom equally, but they're really not. If you're still unconscious and not officially dead, you can theoretically be brought back from pretty much anything. More on that in a bit. But unconsciousness always sets in and persists at a blood level of 500 and below, no matter what. I like to think of that stage like a kind of a coma, but one from which you may be awakened, given proper treatment. Oh, wait a minute, you may have said by now. Unconscious at 500 blood and below? I know for a fact that I've dropped unconscious way earlier than that, when there was still a lot of color on my screen. And yes, you most likely did. Because there is another factor that I haven't mentioned so far that plays a vital role when it comes to unconsciousness. Shock. Shock is another value that you can't measure directly, but you can observe its effect. If your shock value exceeds your blood level, you also drop unconscious. Every time you take damage, you incur a certain amount of shock. Shock builds up in the background as a hidden value while you fight. It plays a major role which part of your body suffers damage. Your head is extremely susceptible to shock damage, even from fists. Have you ever punched somebody in the head or have been punched and were knocked out almost instantly? That's because it only takes three punches to an unprotected head to make your shock value jump over the maximum blood level of 5000. Which implies that a punch to the head may deal roughly about 2000 shock damage. It's no coincidence that warriors during all eras of history armored their head first when they went to battle. And that rule is also true in DayZ. If you expect to get yourself into trouble, wear a helmet to dampen those nasty blows to the head with whatever weapon. You do, however, get up fairly quickly after being knocked out. It's a matter of seconds. This means that shock fades quite quickly as you and your body recover from the, well, shock. This also means that repeated minor damage in slow succession doesn't have a tendency to knock you out. You simply recover your composure in the meantime. You're not too impressed overall. Sudden intense bursts of damage, however, may cause you to collapse spontaneously. I'd like to tell you the rate at which you recover from shock, but I simply can't. Observing one variable that can only be approximated when an effect happens that is directly dependent on another variable that can also not be properly quantified is, well, let's say tricky. So for now, just be aware of the existence of shock and try to avoid suffering repeated major injury in a short period of time. I think that's a good advice in general. But what I can tell you is how you can get your blood level back up. 
First, there's natural regeneration, which I talk about in detail in my first video, and which I will sum up later in this video. Secondly, your blood level can be restored if somebody infuses you with blood from a blood bag IV, or saline solution from a saline bag IV. You cannot do this procedure on yourself, but only on other people, so somebody would have to help you. Currently, a saline bag IV fully restores your 5000 blood, has no possible complications, and is easily created or found. Blood bag IVs, on the other hand, restore only 1000 blood, are likely fatal if used improperly and have to be filled by a donor first. Notice something? Yeah, blood bags aren't only complicated and almost useless, but they are also a potential cause of a chronic case of death. This is of course nonsense, well, aside from the potentially fatal part, that one's correct. But from both a game balance point of view, as well as considering reality, you can currently replace your entire blood with saline and be perfectly fit. But then again, you can also live without blood at all, so there's that. As of now, blood bags are pretty much dead weight and there is no reason whatsoever to prefer them over saline, if available. I'm as convinced as one can possibly be that those are only placeholder properties that are definitely going to change in the future. That is why I will still cover blood bag IVs and talk about what you need to take into consideration to avoid killing your patient. But let's talk about the saline bag IV first, to understand the basics. Saline bag IVs are a two-slot item that can be found primarily in hospitals, but very rarely also in barracks and even civilian buildings. It's a white, flat item that is fairly easy to spot due to its bright color. Saline bag IVs can also be crafted by combining a saline bag and an IV starter kit. Saline bags look similar to saline bag IVs, but they're a bit smaller. They can be found in hospitals as well, and I think occasionally in civilian and military buildings, but I'm not 100% sure if those that I found were saline bags or saline bag IVs. IV starter kits, on the other hand, can only be found as the individual item in hospitals, but there's also always one of them in med kits. Med kits, on the other hand, can be found in hospitals, civilians, and military buildings, so you can indirectly find IV starter kits there as well. If you found a saline bag and an IV starter kit, drag one of them onto the other. Which one you drag doesn't matter. The item you drag the other one onto will be highlighted in yellow, and you can then select Crap from the menu to produce a saline bag IV. To use the saline bag IV, take it into your hands and aim at your patient. The default action should be Give Saline IV. Press F or click your mouse wheel to confirm. You will start the procedure, which takes a few seconds, during which neither you nor the patient must move. If you do, the procedure will be aborted, but you won't lose the item. When you succeed, your patient may now enjoy 5000 fresh units of blood. Or saline, actually. Quick and simple. When it comes to blood bags, things look different. Let's talk about the most important part first. Blood types. In contrast to the universal, pre-filled blood bags in the DAISY mod, in the standalone, blood bags only come empty and need to be filled by collecting blood from a donor. Also, everybody spawns with a certain blood type. Knowing the blood type of the donor and the recipient is incredibly important. Giving incompatible blood to a recipient will kill him. Period. No cure whatsoever. The patient rapidly develops a sickness that cannot be stopped and is always fatal. But hey, at least it's a quick death. Within three minutes, everything is over. So on that light note, let's take a look at the blood compatibility chart. Oof. Quite a lot of death up there. And a lot to remember too. I put a link in the description of this video if you should ever need this chart, but as I said earlier, I recommend staying away from blood transfusions in the current state of the game. It's just not worth the effort or risk. A few general things to remember though, in preparation for what is probably to come. O negative is the universal donor. Blood from those life givers is compatible with everybody else's. This comes at a price though. They can only receive O negative. Everything else will kill them. It's my favorite blood type as a pacifist medic, since I usually don't get myself in the line of fire, and that way I always carry a depot of emergency blood around. But most people probably consider this a curse rather than a blessing. On the other end of the spectrum, we have the blood type AB positive, which will make the eyes of every soldier sparkle. They don't have to be picky at all. Every blood type is fine for them. But of course they are horrible donors. Their blood is only compatible with other AB positives and will kill everybody else. All other groups are somewhere in between, with negatives generally being better donors and positives generally being the better recipients. <sighs> Sorry for that slide. But, like I said, handing blood is quite a bit more complicated than saving. First of all, if you want to handle blood, you need a blood test kit for both participants if you don't know their blood types for sure. 
If in doubt, don't do the transfusion. You can use a blood test kit or to test yourself, your target, or a blood bag. It's a one by one item that used to be exceedingly rare even in hospitals, but I also used to find one or two in civilian or military buildings. I have the impression though that this has changed with the most recent patch since I found significantly more of them in hospitals, well, not in houses or barracks or similar. They are very small and really easy to overlook. For the actual procedure, you need the empty blood bag, of course. It comes with everything that's required to collect blood from another person, and that's also its only usage. The empty blood bags look quite similar to the saline bag IVs, but it's a bit more grayish. They are also 1x2 slots in size vertically and can be found in hospitals. Also, there's always one of them in medkits, along with the IV starter kit that you will need later on. Hold the empty blood bag in your hand, aim at the I very much hope volunteering donor, and select the collect blood option. After the animation is complete, a filled blood bag containing 1000 blood drops onto the floor. This filled blood bag has the same size as an empty one, but it can't be used yet. It has to be combined with an IV starter kit first to create a blood bag IV, just like you would create a saline bag IV. The product is the assembled blood bag IV that can be used to give blood to another player, the same way you would give a saline IV. So we've talked about one part of the primary concerns when it comes to the medical aspects of your well-being and how it doesn't kill you when it's depleted. Let's now take a look at the second half that, you may have guessed it already, will kill you when it's depleted. Health. While it was a huge surprise to me that even losing your entire blood won't take you six feet under, it's no big surprise whatsoever that health does what its name implies. If your health is gone, you are gone. Simple as that. So, how do you know how your health is holding up? Since we know that there are two effects that obscure your vision in the game, and running experiments that isolate blood loss indicated that it is solely responsible for desaturation, it seems likely that blurriness is affected by health. Further experiments, isolating health loss, then led to the confirmation that yes indeed, health is responsible for the blurriness of your screen, and nothing else. This experiment also led to one of my many untimely demises for science through, let's just say, lead poisoning, but that's a different story. Losing health works quite similar to losing blood. When you take damage, you may also take a hit to your health pool. Losing blood and health at the same time, of course, also means that you experience both desaturation and blurriness at the same time. It's easy to think of them as being interconnected, or blurriness even being a glitch that can be removed from the screen by using a trick. More on that in a bit. But they really are the visualizations of two conditions that appear and disappear smoothly and independently. So let's lose some health. The causes for that are pretty much the same as for blood, but do note that blood and health loss aren't necessarily equal or even proportional. There are, for example, degrees of sicknesses that drain only blood, while others drain both in varying amounts. Also note that bleeding isn't listed here. This is one status effect that does in fact only affect your blood level. Who would have guessed? When your health level drops, your screen becomes increasingly blurry. This is a pretty subjective effect, and depending on your computer and settings, your mileage may vary. I'll try to describe what I experience when going through the spectrum of blurriness from full to next to no health, and back. At full health, everything should be as crisp as you'd expect it to, limited by your graphic settings, of course. Clear edges and silhouettes, sharp details on the textures, and small objects can be clearly identified in the scenery. This changes gradually as you start to lose health. At around 4000 health, you will notice that the image isn't quite as sharp as it used to be. At first glance, it looks like you've drastically decreased your resolution, but all edges are also very soft rather than pixelated. You can't make up details and textures anymore, and letters like on town sign become hard to read, unless you press your nose into the sign. Other than that, orientation isn't really impaired. You can still navigate easily through the terrain and through buildings, and aiming and fighting shouldn't be affected unless the target is very far away or very small. As you approach 3000 health, silhouettes start to fade into their surroundings and it becomes difficult to identify shapes and the depth of objects in general. When walking through a building, you will probably run into chairs or other pieces of furniture from time to time. You will also have a hard time spotting or picking up smaller loot items as they become a hazy color blob. You should still be able to make out your targets in a gunfight, but well-placed shots to the head become a matter of chance. At around 2000 health, you can still identify a human being, but telling a player from a zombie can become tricky if he's not right next to you. You lose your sense of depth entirely, and navigating in general and guessing distances becomes a strenuous task. You see the world like through a thick layer of frosted glass in a bathroom. 
Things don't become easier as you get close to 1000 health. I found that a player wearing typical camouflage who doesn't move can't be told from a tall potted plant anymore at moderate distance, and you pretty much have to rely on somebody else staying close to you and guiding you so you don't get lost in the open. Dropping even lower than that, there are hardly any shapes left, and the world is a sea of fuzzy colors and shades until everything turns black at a health level of zero. Now some of you might have said a few minutes ago, um, I've died several times already and I've never experienced anything like that. That is entirely possible, because the blurriness effect becomes inactive when you disable post-processing in your graphic settings. It's a pretty reasonable thing to do from a performance point of view. Post-processing is quite taxing on your hardware, and lower-end computers may not be able to handle it. But also from a gameplay point of view, the blurriness severely impairs your ability to do pretty much anything. So intentionally or not, disabling it is probably pretty common. However, Remember that the blurriness is essentially your health indicator, analogous to desaturation being your blood indicator. If you hide it by disabling post-processing, you become effectively oblivious of the status of the only factor that decides how close you are to dying. This also means that the very common advice that you get when googling blurriness that's supposedly broken because it doesn't go away is possibly a death trap. Yes, blurriness disappears instantly when you just press escape config video. It works. But blurriness isn't broken whatsoever. It does fade. It isn't broken. But for blurriness to fade, you have to have a full blood level and be sufficiently fed and hydrated to have the healthy or rather healing status, which is a variation of healthy that indicates that your health is regenerating. Since the claim that blurriness may be broken because it doesn't disappear can only stem from the fact that those people aren't aware of how health regeneration works, by effectively sweeping the problem under the rug, they continue to run around without ever regaining their health, and this adds up. One zombie scratch here, a whack with a monkey wrench by a naked kamikaze there, a bullet to the leg at the airfield. Now saline IVs are a convenient way to artificially restore your blood level. But this only creates an illusion of recovery. Colors are back because your blood level is back up. But if you were able to see the blurriness that you have only hidden, you would realize that you are really still severely injured. Health cannot be restored artificially. The only way to regenerate your health is having the healing or healthy status, and time. You are actually far more durable than it might seem occasionally. I don't think it's too far-fetched that the impression that your character in DayZ is rather fragile and sometimes dies when somebody just looks at you the wrong way is at least partially caused by this problem. Just to give you an example, during my experiments surrounding finding out the properties and behavior of health, when all required data was gathered, I asked my assistant to ultimately shoot me with an M4 at point blank with me wearing no protection whatsoever. Only the fifth bullet center mass killed me. Knowing that I had regenerated from nearly dead back to full health just before that, during which the blurriness faded just fine, I might add, every shot must have caused above 1000 health damage. Now imagine if you never regenerated your health properly, of course without even knowing that you don't. How much damage have you taken during the lifetime of your character? And how much health do you have left? Is it enough to endure a single hit? The next firefight may be a short one. Please don't go to battle when you really belong in a hospital bed. This takes me to a very important topic, the healthy and healing statuses. Those really drove me nuts for a while. They don't quite work as I expected in some cases, but they are still the best indication for natural regeneration we have at this time. The condition for them to appear is being sufficiently well fed and hydrated for at least 20 minutes. I discussed the details of those requirements in my video focused on the hunger and thirst system, and of course the intricacies of natural regeneration in some lengths, so if you want to know more, be sure to take a look at it as well. For the focus of this video, however, I just want you to be aware that this is the condition that you want to achieve to make sure that you don't run into the blurriness trap. It is currently the only way to restore your health, and to get there, you have to be and stay very well fed and hydrated. Eating a large amount of food will maintain you for a long time, but you can't store much water. Try to develop a habit of drinking often enough so the thirsty message never shows up again. If it does, you need to drink more frequently. If it doesn't, good job. If you succeed at that, the healing or healthy status will appear in your inventory screen after 20 minutes, just like thirsty, hungry, sick or bleeding do from time to time. I like to think of healthy being the main condition and healing being a variation of it. You are considered healthy when your health level is full, or in other words, 
all wounds you have received at some point of your character's life have healed up and you're at the peak of your long-term tolerance for all kinds of punishment. However, do note that healthy only considers your health bar and completely ignores your blood bar. This means that even if you're healthy, you may still be low on blood. But the good news is, it's regenerating. If your health is not full, on the other hand, the status changes from healthy to healing. To allow your health to regenerate, your blood level has to be full first, though. Once your blood has recovered, your health will come back at the same rate. That rate depends on how well you're fed and hydrated. There are two regeneration speeds, slow and full. Slow regenerates at the rate of one blood or health, respectively. At this rate, you regenerate 1.2% of your total amount per minute, which equals a required time period of 83.3 minutes to recover from completely empty to the respective maximum. Full regeneration restores at a rate of 3 units per second, or 3.6% per minute, or 27.7 minutes to go from empty to full. While this may seem slow at first, remember that it is ideally an always-on, ongoing passive regeneration in the background you don't have to do anything special for besides eating and drinking healthily. I want to mention one more point here. There is what I consider to be a glitch currently in the game that was pointed out by a YouTube commenter and two friends in the game. It is possible to be thirsty and healthy at the same time. I did a series of experiments and it turns out you can't only be healthy and thirsty at the same time, you can even be healthy and dying of dehydration at the same time. However, I could also confirm that even if you drink enough to not be thirsty anymore, as long as your water level isn't back to where it has to be for you to be really officially healthy, the regeneration effect remains inactive. They seem to have screwed up the condition under which the status should disappear when they threw in the statuses just before the Christmas break. If you aren't too familiar with the numerical details in the background and this was just gibberish to you, the message is you should drink regularly even once you've reached the healthy status to maintain it. So let us get back to the more easily understandable stuff and sum up the statuses you may have and what they can mean. If you ate and drank enough, you'll become, and hopefully remain, healthy after 20 minutes. That status is continuously shown in your inventory screen when your blood and health pools are full. If your blood level drops from minor damage or bleeding, but your health remains full, you remain healthy and your body uses its ideal condition to repair the damage without delay. Your blood level will immediately start to fill up to counter any blood loss and the temporarily faded colors will quickly return. See how this is far better than relying on blood or saline IVs to restore blood? Like I just said, not every attack is strong enough to impact your health. If it does, however, and both your blood and health level have dropped, your status will switch from healthy to healing to indicate that your overall health is affected. However, remember that your health won't start regenerating before your blood level is back up. So if you continue to fight, take more damage, maybe bleed a lot, it may take quite a while before your health level even gets a chance to replenish. It will remain at its reduced level during that time, and your status will be healing, although it refers to your blood level at the moment. And you will also notice that colors come back before blurriness fades. As soon as your blood level is back up, the restorative powers of your body will start to work on recovering your health. This is the holy grail of natural regeneration and the reason why you should want to eat and drink properly. At this point, any blurriness you have suffered will gradually fade and your vision becomes clearer and clearer and you have the confirmation that you are now in top-notch shape for battle again. I know I'm repeating myself, but I just can't stress the importance of this enough. If you ignore this mechanic, you will never enter the last stage. You will gradually become a very weak and vulnerable husk of what you were at the beginning of your character's life, and may not even be aware of it if you disable blurriness in one way or the other. Now that we have a general overview over the most important aspects of the blood and health system, let's do a quick summary before we put everything together that we've learned today. Blood and health are the two factors that describe the physical condition of your character. While they are related, you should be aware that they are two separate things with different characteristics. You should also know what affects them and what effects each of them have. The way those two are depicted in the game is through visual effects. If your blood level decreases, your screen becomes desaturated. If your health decreases, your screen becomes blurry. The ultimate result of blood dropping below 500 is unconsciousness, but losing it all won't kill you. Losing all your health, on the other hand, will kill you.
Blood can be artificially restored by using blood bag IVs or saline IVs, or naturally by regenerating, indicated by the healthy and healing statuses. Health cannot be restored artificially, but only through natural regeneration, and only if your blood level is at its maximum. It's also useful to know that taking damage also increases the hidden shock value, which causes you to drop unconscious when it exceeds your blood level. The important thing to know about health is that deactivating blurriness makes you oblivious of your health status, and if you don't regenerate in the meantime, all the wounds your character has ever suffered have yet to heal. I'd now like to take you through a short story with two heroes. Two parallel versions of the same scenario. One survivor being blissfully unaware of health and regeneration, not really caring about eating and drinking, and one survivor applying what we figured out and using it to his advantage. I call this story The Tale of Hungry Hank and Well-Fed William. Both our friends just met their untimely demise in one way or the other. Having understood the first rule of Daisy, they didn't grow attached to their gear and don't let that little setback drag them down. They start over, with nicely filled blood and health bars, 5,000 out of 5,000 each, and big ambitions. They want to get back to the northwest airfield, and luckily they spawn in Kamenka, a small town in the southwestern corner of the map. I know, I know, spawn locations have moved to the east coast with the most recent patch, but I like the southwest. Let him enter. So where was I? Right. Our heroes spawn at the coast near Kamenka. They want to see if they can maybe grab a crowbar or a shovel or maybe a mosin with bullets and... Of course, they only find rotten fruit, a worn base cap, half a dozen books and some shotgun shells. But hey, we're not here to complain. While they're searching every corner of that house, like the seven other new spawns did before them since the last server restart, a zombie clips through the wall and starts clawing at them. They are stuck between a chair and the absolutely immovable door of a wardrobe, so the zombie lands a few hits on them and they start bleeding. Awesome start. They panic a little because they know that they only have their fists to defend themselves, and punches usually deal next to no damage. Also, if they were to stand and fight, the zombie would also keep hitting them while they are already bleeding. But Hank doesn't see a way out and starts hitting the zombie from third person, over and over. They exchange blows, and the fight lasts far longer than Hank would have liked to. Eventually, the zombie slouches over. But just as Hank thinks he's safe, the zombie starts getting up again. Still, Hank sees his chance and escapes. William, on the other hand, remembers what he learned about the shock value, and wonders if it also works on zombies. He decides to give it a shot, switches to first person to allow for better aiming, and lands a single punch straight to the zombie's ugly face. The zombie is visibly impressed by his swing and hits the floor like a freshman at his first fret party. William also uses this opportunity and somehow wiggles out of the corner by vaulting over, well, into, through the chair and escapes. Our heroes now sprint for a bit, trying to gain some distance and reach the outskirts of their respective Kamenkas. The freshman zombie has given up the chase by now, so it's time for them to tear up their starter shirts and bandage their wounds. Hank lost quite a bit of blood during that prolonged fight, also due to not being able to bandage up quickly and the intensified bleeding. William also started to bleed, but tis what but a scratch. Their screens are somewhat desaturated now, Hank's more than William's. The grass isn't really green anymore and the sky looks washed out. And they also lost some health in their encounter. Zombies are generally no big threat to health bars. It's the direct blood loss and ongoing bleeding plus shock from the repeated hits that lead to unconsciousness, and that's what gets you. But Hanks and Bill's health still took a slight hit, and their screens become ever so slightly blurred. They continue their respective journeys, looking for the bare necessities further inland. They pick up a backpack, a hatchet, a bit of food, and something to drink in Pavlovo. However, they also run into a not-so-friendly friendly who just returned from the military base, carrying an assault rifle and a gas mask. But the stranger is in a good mood and decides not to give chase after shooting and hitting them once in the chest with his M4. They escape and bandage up again with the second rack from their starter shirts. Their vision is quite grey now and they feel like they need fairly strong glasses. But they got lucky. Before they were scared off, they managed to grab a rare saline IV bag from a house in Pavlovo. They know that they can use this to restore their blood, but since they can't use this on their own, they look for someone to help them. 
for the sake of argument, let's assume they do find someone who doesn't shoot them on sight, and they both get their respective blood levels back to full. But Welfare William knows that he still has to take care of his health bar in the background, and that the blurriness he's experiencing will fade when he does. Hungry Hank, on the other hand, decides that something has to be wrong. He's back to full blood, so everything is fine. Why isn't the blurriness gone? He asks Google and finds out that you can fix this glitch by just going to your video menu and turning off post-processing altogether. Awesome. Problem solved. Hmm. While Hank googles to solve this problem, William decides to focus his search on food for now. In Zelenogorsk, he goes through the larger civilian buildings, market stalls and the supermarket. His search in the large, untouched inland town turns up a can opener, two cans of beans, three cans of tuna, a pack of cereal, a pack of rice, and five cans of soda. He consumes everything right away because he also watched my video on hunger and thirst. <clears throat> he also found a canteen, which he fills up by the local water pump, and while he's there, drinks from it until he's full. In the meantime, Hank only checks in the military buildings. Unfortunately, they have already been hopped clean, and all that's left is more shotgun shells. Yay. While he's there, he also notices that he's getting thirsty once more, and drinks a single can of soda from his backpack, where he stores all his food items in soda cans. They both continue their journeys. Twenty minutes after his feast in Zelenogorsk, William notices something in his inventory screen. A healing status has appeared. Jackpot! Over the course of the next 15 minutes, his vision gradually clears up, and when he checks his inventory the next time, the healing has turned into the healthy status. Knowing that he's A-OK, -okay, he happily travels on. Hank, on the other hand, usually waits for the thirsty or hungry message to appear before he drinks or eats. But all's good, he still has a few more cans in his pack, which he opens with a screwdriver. Life's good. Thinking that he is A-OK, -okay, he happily travels on. They make short stops in Sosnovka and Postoshka to look for more supplies. Every now and then a zombie gets a jump on them. They take a few hits each time, but it's not too bad. It does add up though, and Hank becomes aware that he might need another saline IV sometime later, as his screen does become desaturated again. William, on the other hand, checks his inventory screen after each fight. When he took more than just a few hits, he notices that his healthy status switches to healing for a couple of seconds every now and then. While in the inventory, he also eats another mouthful of beans and takes a sip from his canteen. His screen changes a bit after each fight, but it only takes a few minutes to return to normal. When they arrive in Vibor, their respective journeys are almost over. The untold riches of NWAF await. And so do their squadmates, waiting for them to regroup after the last shootout. One of them has an itchy trigger finger, and even though Hank and Bill announce that they are approaching the meeting point and describing their current appearances, Twitchy McShooty mistakes them for another person with a gas mask and an assault rifle, and accidentally puts a bullet into their stomach. Whoops. No big deal though. Hank needed a saline IV anyway, and the squad does of course carry plenty of those. IVs and bandages are the only things you need in a fight, really. And they also restore you to full blood anyway, so no harm done after all. The squad performs the procedure like they always do after taking damage. They fall into formation and start to move onto the airfield from the west. While William is not too pleased about being shot in the belly, he just shrugs it off with a chuckle. <laughs> Twitchy has always had his quirks. But you couldn't ask for a sniper with faster reflexes to provide cover while you advance. The squad chats for a few more minutes while William's healing status does its job of bringing him back to speed. While at it, they also make sure that they are all in ideal healthy condition, eat an extra can of beans, take several sips from the local water pump and fill their canteens. They fall into formation and start to move onto the airfield from the east. When they approach the hangars from opposite directions, Hanks and William's squads spot each other. Which squad do you think is going to hear the waves of the ocean again soon? I hope you learned something today, and you and your squad mate's survival in Chenaros has become more likely. If you found this video helpful, please remember to like and share it, and subscribe if you want to stay informed about updates and new videos. My name is Marino, and stay healthy, my friends.